welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to Boaty Broadsides. Uh, this is going to be part two of the fascinating interview with Ian Ballantyne about the history of all the HMS Londons. When we left off, we just finished with the First World War. So we're moving into the Second World War and a new HMS London. She's had quite an interesting period in the piece, but she also gets involved in major events such as Bismarck, Tirpitz, all the big names of ships I really don't like. And uh, But she, she has a lot of... She does a lot in, uh, it's another forgotten theatre, but she's hanging around in the South Seas, in the sort of South Atlantic. Yes. And she does quite a bit down there, doesn't she? Which, as I said, is a, it's a theatre that no one ever thinks about. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was of major importance during World War II. Um, obviously, the whole of the Atlantic was, but the South Atlantic, I think that's what you're, is that what you're referring to, the South Atlantic? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, the South Atlantic was of critical importance to uh, Britain due to convoys of, thousands of troops uh, around uh, South Africa and up via the Suez Canal to North Africa, uh, to Egypt, uh, because they, they couldn't convoy them through the Mediterranean because that was a, a dangerous trip that, where they would have been probably more likely to have been sunk. Uh, and so, yeah. yeah, so the Royal Navy had to um, had to range into the South Atlantic to escort convoys, but also because, uh, as, as you know, uh, I'm sure this is something you're very, um, very knowledgeable on. You know, the Grass Spay, uh, the yeah. in, in early days of the war, just being at sea in the South Atlantic could disrupt the whole convoy system across the whole of the Atlantic out of fear. And that's what the, the high seas raiders and U-boats could do. So it wasn't just about sinking ships. It was about disrupting the whole thing. And when Britain re- relied on, you know, troops coming from Australia, I don't know, beef from Argentina or oil from uh, wherever America or stuff from the Caribbean, anything that happened in any part of the South, uh, South Atlantic and the North Atlantic would have an impact, whether it was a battle or um, or some kind of um, disruption to the network. So London's uh, duties down there did include um, escorting convoys that would carry troops. But one of the uh, more interesting things that happened was in May 1941, uh, Bismarck, uh, the famous battleship Bismarck, breaks out. Uh, with the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen and, and goes, uh, has that uh, finale, that battle with the home fleet eventually, and the, the heavy cruiser gets away, uh, has an engineering problem, and eventually goes to a French port. But the ships that were still out there um, were supply ships, which were deployed to supply uh, Bismarck and the Prince Eugen if they stayed out there, and also yeah. U boats as well. So a, a, a shrewd understanding from the Admiralty, uh, uh, was that if you destroy the supply ships uh, that are out there, uh, you capture them, destroy them, whatever you do, just sink them, get rid of them, uh, then uh, you'll undermine a whole raiding sortie by the uh, dastardly surface raiders and the U-boats. And so London was, first of all, called in to help try and find Bismarck uh, in late May. And then afterwards, uh, because she didn't take part directly in that, because so many ships were involved in the pursuit and chase, yeah. but not that not that many in the end took part in the final resolution, you know, the battle on the 27th of May. Um, so London was sent in company with a, a frigate to scour, as were other vessels, to scour the South Atlantic for these, um, these supply ships. So London made three interceptions. One was a vessel called the Esso Hamburg, Another was the Egeland, which scuttled themselves on seeing the London because she put shots across their bow and the threat of her being there and setting across demolition parties was enough to make the Germans think, right, we're going to scuttle the vessel and then hopefully be picked up by, by the cruiser. And and um, so that's what happened. That was between... And they also got uh, London also helped get rid of another ship called the Babatonga. And that all took place um, after the Bismarck action. And uh, one of the... Um, uh, there were quite a few good dits. I mean, that's what uh, naval people call a story, an amusing story. But there were numerous great dits from the sailors uh, that I interviewed because I interviewed ratings and officers who were still around when I did the book uh, for lots of stories. Mm-hmm. But uh, among many, one, one of them was a chap called um, 
Gordon Brute, who was an engineering artificer, artificer down in the engine room. And he, he um, when they disposed of the supply vessel Babitonga, he, um, he was on the upper deck, probably uh, delighted to get out of the engine room just to get some fresh air and watch what was going on with this uh, enemy yeah. supply ship. And he said, um, he, he saw this, he said in his own words, this chap comes up the scrambling net on board the ship. And he said something to the effect of, good morning, gentlemen. In perfect English, and it turned out he was a British guy. They become a naturalised German, and so they captured a, an ex an ex Brit, one of the crew. So uh, I mean, there were there were other stories, many other stories like that. But I mean that, yeah, I mean that's one another another example of a, of a a story that perhaps gets overlooked, but which says quite a bit about the broader war, because I think probably uh, some kind of code breaking uh, played a part in helping to intercept those supply vessels um, and uh, whether it was um, I don't think it was the naval code at that time I mean I'd have to go back again I've written about this but I'm trying to remember the details but I don't know if the, na the, the naval officers code I mean they sank you 110 off Iceland and got a, a treasure trove of stuff but I don't think that was processed by, uh, no, by the time London was doing interceptions was, yeah. so it would have been another another arm of the enigma like the air force or the army or whatever or some kind of human intelligence gathering but i'm pretty sure that some kind of intelligence uh, pointed london towards the and other vessels towards the supply vessels and so that that kind of is a, an insight into the sort of broader war that um uses ships like london we've also got an interesting i was quite interested in this one when i was reading it but we end up having some bit of, a bit of espionage which everybody loves so yes. who was who was corporal james allen and what military police wasn't he yeah 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 i mean that's again that's one of those um lovely little stories that uh, crops up and you think i've got to get this in the book uh, yeah right to simplify it hms london had a major job in um in 1941 in um in the autumn of 1941 taking uh so the, the taking taking a delegation to russia because obviously the russians had uh helped uh the germans you know, divide Poland, taking half of Poland, and then it, it helped in other ways uh, with the German war effort. So June 1941, the Germans invade, and the Russians realise, um, you know, they're in the fight, obviously. I mean, we won't go into all that. But the point was that the British and the, and the Americans, uh, even, even then, were thinking that they wanted to try and help the Russians because it would um, assist the... Uh, the the Allied cause because of course Britain was in the war alone in inverted commas but actually had the help of America quite a bit even though not at war and also mm. the uh, the Australia Canada etc so the Allied cause you know and there were the the French the Dutch and others in their own free and independent arms that were working with the Royal Navy uh, the Air Force and the Army so the Allied cause would benefit from helping Stalin and Russia so H H London was sent on a mission. Uh, with uh, a lot of diplomats and other VIPs to Archangel in the White Sea uh, to, to drop them off. And they then go, and I'm simplifying this, they would then go to Moscow, talk to the Russians about how we can help. And in the meantime, uh, London would help uh, with the uh, journey home of the earliest convoy um, to Russia with supplies. And they, while they were waiting for the diplomats and the other VIPs, including Lord Beaverbrook, and an American representative, etc., and top brass to come back, they went and helped escort that convoy. Now, London, getting to the point of this story, then went back to Archangel and embarked all these people. And one of the people that had uh, assigned themselves or somehow joined this diplomatic mission was Allen, James Allen, Corporal, you know, of the Royal Military Police. And this guy had turned up in Russia and he had uh, in Moscow and had been added on. Uh, in mysterious circumstances. So the first thing that happened to him was when he got on board HMS London Archangel and they set off into the White Sea, and then the Barents heading home uh, to the UK, it was a checkup. And one of the people I quote in, in the book was Surgeon Lieutenant Ransom Wallace, who was whose relatives were very helpful to me uh, with the book. And he was the guy who was checking out uh, Corporal Allen to make sure he was healthy. And he heard this story from uh, Allen, which was, to sum up, that he was captured by the Germans at Calais uh, in the summer of 1940, but then said he'd escaped from a prison camp and headed across Poland to Russia. And then what happened then, according to uh, Surgeon Lieutenant uh, Ransom Wallace, was that the Russians suspected him of being a spy, locked him up, 
and and they, in his words, they knocked him about and generally ill-treated him for a time, but eventually released him from the Lubyanka prison. And he made his way to the British Embassy. It was passed on to accompany the mission, the diplomatic mission home. That's what the surgeon said. So they still didn't trust him. And they thought perhaps he was a Russian. And so you could see that the distrust and the suspicion of the communist uh, superpower, Russia, was there, even though everybody was trying to help each other. And so there was not uh, there was a fair bit of distrust. So they thought he might be a Russian spy and he was pretending to be Corporal Allen. And and um, they they had, uh, at one point, they pretended that the London had turned around and gone back to Russia to see what, what, what Corporal Allen did. I suppose if he broke out into Russian and panicked and ran around thinking, you know, the NKVD is going to put a bullet in the back of my head because I failed in my secret mission, I suppose they would have rumbled him. But in fact, he was... He was British and he was a genuine, the genuine article and they, um, he got a medal in the end. So uh, their suspicions were unfounded. And um, I, don't know if, I don't know if you need me to give you any more background on him, but it's, uh, it's, no, uh, no, it's no, a great no. story. Yeah. yeah to, be, to be fair, his, oh yeah, I was captured at Calais and then yeah. I escaped POW camp. And then I got caught across Poland. It's like, yeah, all right, mate, pull the other one. Yeah, I can yeah, understand exactly. immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I could, I could, yeah, I could see why they were a bit, a bit worried. Um, and uh, but anyway, he turned out to be okay, and um, and I don't know what happened to him after that. But um, it's, it's an interesting little story, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But um, we're talking about convoys. I don't think we could ever get away with talking about Arctic convoys without mentioning the dreaded PQ seventeen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a com- it's a story that um, is well known and complex. That's all I'll sum it up. I mean, I did a lot of um, research and writing on it. Uh, because it was trying to tease out what happened with HMS London. What 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 was she? And that's the thing about um, this story is that although uh, HMS London, apart from shooting down um, aircraft with their main guns, which had specially adapted ammunition, and occasionally firing a gun at a passing U-boat or a U-boat she was passing that was on the surface, uh, and witnessing attacks by the Luftwaffe and U-boats on the convoys, uh, didn't actually engage in any pitch battles. It was anti-aircraft guns, etc., and and trying to deter the Germans. So it's trying to get to the bottom of why it had such an important part in HMS London's story, and that that was because she was the flagship of the cruiser squadron. And again, keeping it simple, you had the, the close escort. Well, you mm-hmm. had uh, armed trawlers, anti-aircraft guns, in among the merchant ships. You can correct me if I've got any of this wrong. Because uh, it's all in the book, but I mean, remembering it all is the task. Mm-hmm. And then you had the close escort of destroyers, uh, and maybe some sloops there. And then you had the cruiser force. And then miles and miles away to the west, you had the home fleet with uh, uh, King George V class battleship and an American battleship by then, uh, as the heavy duty uh, hammer. If uh, Turpit, which was lurking in the fjords, and others came yeah. out to attack. So London's job as the, the cruiser was uh, for uh, uh, to be the command ship of this convoy. London was the flagship of the first cruiser squadron uh, under Rear Admiral Louis Hamilton. So he was the guy who basically uh, was on the spot in command. And then you had Admiral uh, John Tovey in command of the home fleet, the heavy hammer, launching over to the west uh, in case Turpitz comes out. And then you had uh, Admiral Dudley Pound, the first sea lord in London, and all of these people yeah. have got different ideas. And Hamilton's the kind of meat in the sandwich between um, Admiral Pound and John Tovey. Uh, and so he get, has had instructions before PQ-17 leaves for for uh, uh, Russia. And he, he's trying to figure out what he should do. And he thinks everything is settled. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of skipping over some of the detail here. But in, in essence, what happens is... The Admiralty, um, and you can maybe clarify this for listeners as well, the Admiralty panics at the thought via all its um, intelligence inputs, which it decides to ignore in certain respects. Uh, mm. It decides that the first thing or decides that by instinct that there are signs that uh, Turpitz has come out and that Turpitz is going to destroy this convoy uh, of vessels uh, with all their goods and uh, etc. going to Russia. And so it says scatter. And so instead of sticking together with a coordinated um, a coordinated defence, which would have seen off, hopefully, um, the Tirpitz and, and still seen off the U-boats and the aircraft, 
uh, the, the convoy is ordered to break up, which makes it impossible to do, to escort. And the close escort, and this is on Admiral Hamilton's initiative, really, the close escort of destroyers is withdrawn, joins the cruisers, and they then head uh, head to the west, thinking they're about to engage the Tirpitz and be in this, this pitch battle. Because uh, there were th three, I think it's three signals, isn't it, that arrive in quick succession yeah. from the Admiralty, which say, uh, which say cruiser force withdraw, high speed, and then uh, explains, owing to threat from surface ships, convoys to disperse and proceed to Russian ports. And then another signal comes in, and then convoys to scatter. So those three signals are read by Admiral Hamilton, who thinks, well, what the, you know what? And, and, <laughs> and so th this situation happens where the merchant ships are left to it, the cruisers race away, and as they speed on to the west, they realise that there's no turpits, and they've left the convoy to be um, picked to pieces. And that is a very concise, simple person's summary of what is quite a complex chapter. So I apologise, but if you want to get it in detail, read the book. Absolutely, definitely go. Uh, if anyone, everyone listening, go and buy the book and read it. But um, <laughs> yeah, at some point, we need to. Uh, PQ seventeen is an episode yeah, all in it. So. It is. It is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's got really a lot of that. layers, a lot of sort of minor and major cockups. And uh, but anyway, yeah, no, that, that so. But the thing about HMS London was that her crew, uh, uh, Royal Marines and sailors, felt terrible about this and they were very angry about mm -hmm. it. So there was months of recriminations during fist fights and people uh, in bars and pubs were ever ashore. And the Americans weren't very happy because a lot of the merchant ships were American and the Americans had had a cruiser and also destroyers on, a, on escort duty as well as a battleship with uh, Admiral Tobey. And it was this big thing that the Americans and the British would get this convoy through to, to Russians and Uncle Joe and it had all been a complete cock-up. So there were kind of ill feelings between the Allies, you might say, which, to be fair to the US and Navy, soon dissipated because they realised it wasn't the Royal Navy's fault at all what had happened it wasn't the ship should we say it wasn't not the royal navy's fault it wasn't the um the cruiser's fault it wasn't the the warship's fault or the sailor's fault but there, there was a lot of um recriminations and even at the end of the war it was a thing that they they didn't want to talk about in fact it was kept secret uh, and they weren't they were told not to talk about it because it was such a disaster but it festered within the the, uh, the souls of i would say quite a few HOS London cruiser men, Royal Marines and sailors. So yeah, it had a huge impact on their, on them personally. Yeah, it's um, it was a uh, just an absolute massacre. And uh, yeah. the irony is, apart from the U boats, the Kriegsmarine didn't do anything. So what you had was you had thirty five merchant ships in a convoy, and then due to the almighty uh, scatter uh, cock up, what happened was that um, a lot of them were sunk, and um, I would say uh, between the fifth of July. And the 10th of July, um, 1942, there were 20 merchant ships on a convoy PQ-17 sunk, and only 11, um, I've said only 11, so I've got 31 there. Oh, yeah. Um, only 11 reached their intended destination. It's where you get into facts and figures here, isn't it? So I've got the 20 PQ-17 merchant ships were lost, and only 11 merchant ships reached their intended destination. That's a qualification. And they were two British, seven American, and two Russian. And then, oh, yeah, a number of American vessels uh, it's one of the complexities of convoys. A number of American vessels also gave up the fight because they felt that, you know, we'd been abandoned, that we were under attack. So um, they were run aground and, and um, so they were captured uh, by the Germans or were killed. So, I mean, it was uh, just an almighty, almighty cock up. Yeah. For the, loss of, uh, for the loss of five German aircraft. Was it really? Five German aircraft? Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, Turpitz did come out, but then went back in again uh, in the end. And um, so, yeah, I mean, so there was never a, an attack, uh, an actual attack uh, by Tirpitz. Uh, so yeah. it was only five Luftwaffe aircraft, was it? Apparently, yeah. I, 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 again, I, uh, again, I have to edit this bit out. I, I quickly glanced at Wikipedia for the facts, which I know oh, is right. the, the font of all knowledge. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> apparently yeah. it's fine. But I, I, I haven't got it to hand. So, no, um, no. But there were, yeah, I mean, like the U-boats, you know, you know, based in northern Norway, you know, they had quite a... Uh, a good time from their point of view. They sank lots of uh, lots of ships, um, and uh, but it didn't stop the convoys. And I think they they learned their lesson. No. You know. But moving on from the Second World War, um, moving after the Second World War, we have one final another battle on it, the Yangtze. What happened on the River Yangtze? Um, when it comes to the Yangtze, uh, London was there because post war uh, she was still uh, in service. I would say on what you might call. Um, 
residual British Empire policing duty and trying to protect British interests around the world and look after various um, colonies and out in um, the Far East, as it was called then. So she would uh, be operating out of Singapore, and, uh, but by 1947 was based in Hong Kong. And the idea was to protect merchant vessels from attack by pirates, and also because the Chinese Civil War was raging, so there was there was an awareness that there might need to be uh, might need to be protection provided against either side actually attacking uh, British citizens or um, British merchant vessels. By April 1949, the, the the Nationalists and the Communist People's Liberation Army were facing each other across the Yangtze, and the Communists were poised to take Shanghai, but also Nanking. At the time, Nanking, as the westernised um, way of saying it, Nanking was the was the capital of uh, nationalist China, and so as a consequence of that, there were uh, obviously British and other uh, foreign delegations in Nanking, with what was still the China, and uh, but the communists were closing in, uh, and they held the north bank of the river, and they were going to be planning a crossing to seize the South Bank from the Nationalists. So the destroyer consort was known as the Nanking Guardship, HMS Consort, with the frigate HMS Amethyst, very famous name due to this, um, up the river uh, by late April to relieve the consort. But what happened was, to simplify it, Amethyst was trapped um, uh, on the uh, Yangtze River at Nanking by, by the Communists who closed in and couldn't escape. So... With HS London and other vessels down at Shanghai, it was decided that what would happen is that they would send um, London fast up the uh, the Yangtze with uh, um, a ship called the Black Swan, a sloop, and they would um, they would go up there and displaying prominent British flags so that hopefully nobody would fire on them. They would pluck the Yangtze uh, from her captivity. And bring her back down the river. However, it didn't quite go to to plan, um, and the, the it was the communist guns that opened fire on London. So she weathered the most incredible storm of fire. It was probably the most intense, and in fact, it was the most intense and savage combat that the ship saw. In, you know, in, in 1949, and um, somebody described. Uh, I mean, I describe it in the book as a, a mission against the odds, and as illogical in pure operational terms as the Arctic convoys. But they, they decided they had to do it. Uh, and so they did, as, on a point of honour, I suppose, to rescue the amethysts. And, uh, but they did hope they wouldn't be fired on by the communists. That failed. And, and the main fire um, that was um, hitting them and causing the most damage was anti-aircraft guns. Uh, mm-hmm. There was 75mm and 105mm calibre. But actually, it was like 4-inch four, four and 40mm weapons that punched the most holes in the ship. And so they, they went up there at high speed and then at one stage uh, ran out of control and, and, and reversed. I mean, I've got, I, I talked to various Royal Marines, uh, various sailors from that crew, because when I wrote the book, quite a few of them uh, still around. And, um, and I also used their, um, their, their, their um, ship association uh, archives to get accounts too. Yeah. So I was able to piece together quite a, quite a, quite a, um, a visceral um, first person narrative. And, um, and I mean, one of the guys was uh, that um, is in there is uh, sort of telling Christopher Parker Jarvis, who who recalls that um, uh, that what they did was they once they were being fired upon uh, by the Chi- uh, Chinese Communist guns and realised that the you know showing the Union Jack was not going to protect them, they and they were flying a white flag as well. They took down the white flag and according to what he said, they trained all guns a beam and opened fire. And they um, and but the thing was they had to wait. For the uh, the the uh, the Chinese guns, the Chinese communist guns, to open fire so they could spot mm. them because of course they were hidden on the riverbank. It was hard to yeah. spot, them. and that was all there was to see. And the range was what two thousand yards, he said. And and then he said we were firing almost horizontally, if not at depression, which meant that any errors in elevation, especially for the eight inch guns, the main guns of London were were eight inch guns, caused very large alterations in range. So it was very difficult to find out um, find out where the enemy was. And so, in the end, it was just a, a forlorn, a forlorn uh, venture up the river. So they had to turn around and had suffered um, thirteen killed, fourteen seriously wounded, and forty lightly wounded. And it was the exposed, 
because London had secondary four-inch guns whose crews were exposed on the upper deck to, to crew them. Mm. And they were the ones that suffered the... Uh, and their supply parties, the people that brought them shells and charges uh, for their guns, or rather char- uh, shells for their guns, uh, they, they took the most casualties. So it was a very bloody, bloody affair um, with, you know, 46 British uh, dead and um, j- just in the, you know, the Yanks incident altogether. And London fired 158 eight inch shells, 494 four inch, and 2,625 rounds of close range, i.e., cannon, cannon fire. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So it was um, it was a very intense episode, and um, you know I haven't really done it justice there with my description. But if people want to to read the accounts in the book, then it's, I mean, one very vivid account is by a guy who I went to see actually, uh, called Bandmaster Harwood, who who was in charge again. This is to do with casualties. Who was in charge of trying to care for the casualties below decks, and that's a very uh, vivid and powerful account that he gave me when I went across to interview him. So well worth a read. Um, but yeah, that yeah, that yeah. was the the World War Two London's finale, as it were. Yeah, it's quite a finale to go out on. It was even for us. I mean, we we've covered about what three hundred years worth of, <laughs> of naval history. <laughs> yeah, about an hour, just about an hour. Yeah. So um... <laughs> I mean, I'll just I just uh, like yeah. to mention the lo- the last two. I mean, there was, there was a yeah. county class uh, destroyer in, in in the Cold War. That's in, in obviously in the book, uh, which uh, ha- uh, ventured into the Black Sea at one stage. Which, Provided quite an amusing story where her, her sailors went hands to bathe, jumped over the side near a Russian uh, warship that was shadowing them and started to swim. And the Russians thought that the uh, the crew of the London were actually abandoning ship to flee the capitalist West, <laughs> join, the, join the Russian Navy and put down scrambling nets and ladders. And then the, the captain of London, which was the 1960s destroyer London, county class destroyer, uh, was with this. This is a guy I quote in the book. Uh, was his attention was drawn to this because he was in the sea with the sailors and, and he said oh we better we better turn around and swim back to our own ship in case they think we're going to defect or words to that effect so that was that <laughs> ship i mean that ship did uh quite a lot of uh, interesting stuff but the last london was a type 22 uh frigate which i went to i was lucky enough to do a 50th anniversary cruise uh, at the end of the cold war from uh, Rosyth mm-hmm. to um Mermansk and archangel aboard that london um, and that was um, astonishing, you know, because we went into the very secret parts of Murmansk and um, into the White Sea where no Western warship had been for 50 years. London had yeah. done uh, Hunt for Red October style, if you like, on the surface, surveillance and counterintelligence in the Barents Sea, trying to nick Soviet torpedoes, practice torpedoes and spying on on on, on exercising things. And so she had done a, lot, a fair bit up there because that London Type 22 frigate was a surveillance vessel as well as an anti-submarine warfare vessel. I went mm-hmm. aboard that that ship in 1991, and that was the end of the Cold War um, between the Soviet uh, Navy, as it still was, and the Royal Navy. Uh, I won't bore you with any of the details, but it was it was an amazing an amazing event. But that that London had also been the flagship of the Royal Navy Task Group in uh, Desert Storm in the Gulf War, which um, I covered as a, a journalist. But I didn't go above aboard London; I went aboard other warships in the Gulf. Uh, but that was also an incredible thing because she was there up, up threat off Kuwait when the last battleship bombardments of, in history yeah. were unleashed by Missouri and Wisconsin, the American battleships, uh, and, and an event during which an American, uh, sorry, a British destroyer uh, saved, reputedly saved one of those battleships from being hit by a missile. That was actually was Gloucester uh, by mm-hmm. using her own missile to shoot down an Iraqi missile that was going towards the battleship. So that, was, that episode is in the book. And London was the flagship, was nearby, and then she did that thing to Russia, and then she was sold under defence cuts in the late 90s to uh, to the Romanian Navy, um, and there will be another London um, when we're all, you know, elderly, because um, it takes a while to build warships these days. Uh, that'll yeah. be a city yeah, class. <laughs> no, not like Dreadnought, no. Not like the 1906 Dreadnought. Uh, no, so uh, Type 26 Frigate, um, yes, same job really, but more heavily armed than the last London, uh, which still serves on in the Romanian fleet. So that's a whole kettle of uh, other fish, shall we say? That brings us about four hundred years. Yes, Six, yeah. sorry, you had to cut through months. that bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, as you said, it's all it's all beautifully documented in the book, um, and I can't recommend it enough. But you just remind everyone what her, what the book's title is and where it's available from. Yeah, the book, the book, the the book that I I recommend is the paperback edition, the new paperback edition which came out at the end of last year, 
Uh, so HMS London from fighting sail to the Arctic convoys in tomorrow's war. And that's the one with a really handsome picture of uh, some Arctic convoy uh, uh, sailors uh, aboard HMS London with their uh, eight inch guns behind and a, and a future London in the bottom. So don't get confused, much though I love it with the hardback, because I know some people have bought that being slightly confused. Look for the paperback because that's the one that's expanded. And I've revised the photos, I've changed some of the photos added appendices about the Eastern Fleet in the Second World War as well as uh, that London that's a wreck, blah, blah, blah. And and also a new chapter on the Ukraine war and future wars and the next London and, and other stuff. So I've digressed again. Apologise for that. But that's, that's the that's one right. to go to. Yeah, published by Pellets yeah. Books, HMS London. And we'll, uh, we'll try, we'll, I'll speak nicely to Alex, see if we can get it on the uh, History Hat bookshop. So that way, um, the podcast get a tiny slice of the money. You get a larger slice of the money if we go through, if we uh, than if you went through Amazon. So instead yeah. of Jeff Bezos using the money to build his own warships, we can. Yeah. Uh, you get some, which because you know, authors we don't get paid anything. So no, I was gonna... <laughs> you get more of a you get more of a slice than if it went in through uh, through Amazon. So uh, yeah, thank, thanks again for coming on, Ian, and uh, um, we should we should get together and do, do another one of these sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, it'd be wonderful. Yeah, if you ever want to talk about any of my other books, and it'd be great to have a chat with you. I enjoyed it very much. Absolutely, no problem. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.